Hello Cerritos Anatomy students. I hope you're all doing well. This PowerPoint lecture will be for your lab on the spinal cord, which was the end of Unit 7 that we didn't get to yet, and Special Senses, which is Unit 8 in your lab book. So we'll be going over those two today. Uh, you'll have a quiz on this material next Monday, which is April 6th. I'll open up the quiz at 8 a.m. on Canvas under the quizzes section. It'll still be 15 questions. It'll probably be multiple choice, some fill in the blank. You'll have half an hour to take the quiz, and I'll leave the quiz open for 24 hours. So um, it'll, I'll give you some time to do it if you guys are working. Um, otherwise, we won't have any live lectures. I might have a live Zoom study session at some point to study for an upcoming exam. If you guys need anything or want to see anything different from me, please let me know. Also, so along with our quizzes due every week on the material that we did the week before, um, also on quiz day will be the assignment due, and I always will assign pages from the understanding concept section at the end of each unit. So you'll have to fill in pages 127 to 131 in your lab book. That's for the special senses, understanding concepts. To submit those to me, you can take a picture of them and just upload them as a JPEG file or a PDF, however you wish, uh, to the assignment section. So there should be an option for submission for that. Like usual, please let me know if you have any questions. So we'll get started with this spinal cord. This is what we didn't get to yet. Um, and I'll go through and highlight. Again, you only need to learn the terms in the green boxes in your lab book. Um, so as we're looking at the spinal cord, the conus medullaris or conus medullaris is the tapered lower end of the spinal cord. So it's the end of the spinal cord. Um, it usually ends around L1 or L2. The phylum terminale provides a connection between the conus medullaris and the coccyx, which stabilizes the entire spinal cord. So you can see the conus medullaris in the picture ending around L1 or L2. And then you can see the phylum terminale just providing a connection uh, between the end of the spinal cord and the coccyx, which will just stabilize the structure. Uh, the cauda equina in Latin, that literally means horse's tail. Maybe you've heard of the word equestrian if you've ridden horses. Uh, cauda equina is a bundle of spinal nerves and spinal nerve rootlets that comes out at the end of the conus medullaris. Um, and it just looks like a bunch of, almost like a horse's tail as it comes out. If any of you guys ever get to dissect a cadaver, uh, when you open up the connective tissue that surrounds the spinal cord, this conus medullaris just pops out and it's kind of alien-like looking because you see all these spinal nerves just kind of popping out, literally looking like a horse's tail. So those are the three that you need to know under spinal cord. Then here we have a cross-section of the spinal cord. Uh, dorsal refers to the posterior side and ventral refers to the anterior side. We divide this cross-section into white matter and gray matter. Uh, the white matter is the lighter colored area surrounding the gray matter that looks like a butterfly shape. Within the white matter we have columns or areas called funiculus, funiculi for plural. Uh, the anterior column will be the area in white matter in front of the ventral horn. The posterior column in funiculus will be the area right behind the dorsal horn in white matter. And then the lateral column, the lateral funiculus will be the area in white matter uh, right adjacent to the lateral horn. Uh, the horns refer to the gray matter then in gray, or in this picture it's a little bit darker tan. The dorsal horn is the posterior horn in the gray matter. The anterior or ventral horn is the part in the front of that gray looking butterfly and the lateral horns are on the side. We also have um, roots of spinal nerves going into the back of the spinal cord and exiting out of the front. And you can see uh, the dorsal root ganglion, also posterior root ganglion. This carries sensory information into the posterior side of the spinal cord. 
So this is the dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion is a little bit of a bulging out of the dorsal root um, that has cell bodies of sensory neurons. So there's your dorsal root ganglion leading into the dorsal root, entering into the dorsal horn. Once that sensory information comes into the dorsal horn, um, that sensory information gets sent up to the brain and then back down again, and any sort of motor response gets sent out of the ventral root or the anterior root in the spinal cord. Together, the dorsal root and the ventral root will eventually come together and form what we call a spinal nerve, and I'll have a better picture of that in the next slide. So this is a really good slide. It explains or it shows uh, that cross section of the spinal cord again. It shows the dorsal root ganglion um, and then it also shows each spinal nerve coming out of the connection between the dorsal root ganglion, um, the dorsal root and the ventral root. So the dorsal root ganglion, the dorsal root enter the spinal cord into the back of it and the ventral root exits the spinal cord out of the front, and together they will make up a dorsal root. Also in this picture, we have the meninges that are showed. If you remember meninges, we talked about the layers that cover the brain. Well, the layers that cover the brain also continue down and cover the spinal cord. And these meninge layers um, will be in the exact same order that they were in the brain. The dura mater, will be the outermost meninge layer. The arachnoid matter will be the second innermost layer. And then the pia matter will be um, the third innermost layer or deepest layer of these meninges. You have an epidural space um, listed there as well as a subarachnoid space. And you can see in the drawing on the top, the cross section of the spinal cord and the vertebra, you can see where the epidural space is labeled, as well as the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space, the word sub or the prefix sub means below. So the subarachnoid space will be the space right below the arachnoid matter. And this will contain cerebral spinal fluid, um, which is important. Uh, for different things that you'll hopefully learn about in your anatomy lecture. So that takes us through uh, the spinal cord. We'll go on to the next slide. So our next slide is the sympathetic trunk or the sympathetic chain and its ganglia. Um, the sympathetic trunk ganglion are basically the ganglion or cell bodies that are connected to cell roots that come out of the spinal cord and connect the spinal nerves together. Uh, the sympathetic trunk ganglia has to do with the sympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight response. And the sympathetic trunk ganglion are little tiny bulges. They look kind of like a ladder that follows along the vertebra on either side. So these are your sympathetic chain and ganglia. Then you'll notice we have some plexes or a plexus. This is your cervical plexus. Whenever you see the word plexus, that just means a network of nerve fibers that supply innervation to some sort of structure. The cervical plexus supplies innervation to structures in the neck and trunk. And the phrenic nerve is a nerve that originates in the neck and passes down between the lung and heart to reach the diaphragm. And that's listed there. The brachial plexus is a plexus in the arm. Um, from the brachial plexus, um, again, it's a network of nerves. We get three nerves, or many nerves, but the three that you need to know are the medial nerve, the ulnar nerve, and the radial nerve. You can see them listed there. The nice thing about the radial, median, and ulnar nerve is they will actually follow down the entire length of your arm in the same spots that your radius will be and your ulna bone will be. So your radial nerve follows along the lateral side of your arm all the way down, and your ulna nerve follows alongside um, the medial side where your ulna bone would be. The median nerve travels right down the middle. The lumbar plexus is a network of nerve fibers that supply the skin and muscles of your lower limb. From the lumbar plexus, we want you to be able to identify the femoral nerve 
Um, it's one of the major nerves that comes out of the lumbar plexus and your femoral nerve will supply your quadricep muscles with innervation. Then we have your sacral plexus. Um, it provides motor to muscles of your pelvis and your lower extremity. From here, we want you to be able to identify your sciatic nerve, which comes out um, right underneath the greater sciatic notch. If you remember that structure in the, ish, uh, the ilium bone, the sciatic nerve um, travels all the way down the posterior side of the body, and then it splits into the tibial nerve, which will go on the median side of the lower leg, and then the common fibular or common peroneal nerve on the lateral side. So with that, we'll go ahead and start unit eight. So there really isn't much to unit seven that you need to focus on. Um, for your quiz next week, I'm really just going to focus on the spinal cord structures. I probably won't have any questions about the plexuses, just focus on the spinal cord structures. But let's focus on then unit eight, which has to do with your special senses. And we'll focus on the anatomy of your eye and the anatomy of your ear. So your eyes use photoreceptors to help form images of the environment. And we're going to start with accessory structures that are on the external side of the eye that help protect your eyes against foreign objects and ensure that your eye surface remains clean and moist. So these are external structures. We have your eyebrows, your eyelashes, conjunctiva, and then your eyelids. Just going to go ahead. I'm on page 116. Again, you can read through the entire lab to help with understanding, but I'm just going to be focusing on the terms in the green boxes. Uh, your eyelids are movable anterior protective coverings for the eye. The conjunctiva is a mucous membrane that covers the front of the eye and lines the inside of your eyelids. And then we'll talk about what the lacrimal apparatus is. So this is a look at accessory structures of the eye. Um, you can see your eyelids there. Your eyebrows are important for keeping sweat out of the eye. Eyelashes help to act as a barrier for anything that's coming into your eye really rapidly. The conjunctiva, uh, you can't see here because it's a clear covering. You see your sclera is the white part of the eye and the conjunctiva is again just a clear layer that covers um, the sclera and also the inside of your eyelids for protection. Here's a look at some a sagittal section of your eyes accessory structures. Um, I'm going to focus on your extrinsic eye muscles in this picture. I don't have them all listed here uh, because in your picture all six extrinsic eye muscles have been labeled for you. But you have six extrinsic eye muscles that help to control movements of the eye. You have a lateral rectus, a medial rectus, superior rectus, and then in, you also have an inferior rectus, which I don't think is listed there, but you also have a superior and inferior oblique muscle. So these six different muscles just attach themselves to the eyeball itself, and it allows for extremely precise movement of your eyes. And if you think about it, just look away from your screen. You can look around your room and your eyes can go in a million different directions. They can move extremely precisely. Um, and it's just amazing how quickly your eyes can move. And that's due to these extrinsic eye muscle structures. Uh, the lateral and medial rectus muscles will be on the lateral and medial parts of the eye. Superior rectus will be attached to the top part of the eye. Your superior and inferior oblique muscles um, control the angle at which the eye will turn at an oblique angle, and they'll be attached to the top and bottom of the eye, respectively. So now let's back up to the lacrimal apparatus. So there's a couple of things you need to know about the lacrimal apparatus. This is your picture you should label on page 116. Um, first of all, what is this? It produces, collects, and drains lacrimal fluid or tears from the eye. Uh, tears are extremely important for lubricating the anterior surface of the eye. Your tears have an enzyme in it called lysozyme, and that helps to prevent bacterial infections in your eye. So you have a constant kind of cleaning system that's going through your eye all the time. Okay. So this is a picture of your lacrimal apparatus. It's pretty similar to the one you guys have to label 
and I just lost my page here, so um, I think you guys have to label the lacrimal gland. That's one part you have to label. Uh, you'll have to label, label the lacrimal sac, and then the nasolacrimal duct. So how this works is the lacrimal gland will secrete the tears containing the lysozyme. They will, the tears will kind of sweep or clean over the sides of your eye. And then in order for those tears to drain, they'll have to drain uh, through the lacrimal canaliculi. And the lacrimal canaliculi is a tiny canal that drains the tears from the eye into the lacrimal sac. So you have um, the lacrimal caniculi you can see on your picture. There's two of them. Um, technically, they're both caniculi. So you have one draining from the top and one draining from the bottom of the eye. They drain the tears into the lacrimal sac and then the tears drain into the nasolacrimal duct. That will actually empty out into your nose. So this is why when you cry, um, you might sniff, sniffle a little bit um, because those tears are actually draining into your nose. Okay, so let's get into the eye structure itself. And you have several pictures to label here. I'll talk a little bit about these structures and then I'll show you a picture as well. Uh, the sclera refers to the white part of the eye. The eye itself is a practically spherical organ, about two and a half centimeters in diameter. You have flat cushions that surround the eye within the eye socket. Uh, the anterior and posterior cavities re refer to the area in front of the lens that contain aqueous humor, which is very fluid-like. And the posterior cavity refers to the area behind the lens that contains permanent vitreous humor. And the vitreous humor is a lot more gel-like in structure. Uh, so think of jello or jelly. And that vitreous humor helps to give the eye its shape. So it keeps the structure of the eye. Uh, there's three layers to the eye wall, the fibrous, the vascular, and the retina. Uh, the fibrous tunic we call, um, we divide that into the sclera and the cornea. And I, you guys don't need to know these different layers in terms of fibrous tunic, vascular tunic, and retina. You just need to know the structures that are listed in your green box there. So the sclera is the white parts of the eye. The cornea is the clear part of the eye that will surround the iris and the pupil. So the cornea is the place where you would put a contact lens. Uh, the vascular tunic is named vascular because it has to do with blood vessels. And the vascular tunic has your iris, which is the colored part of your eye. Uh, the ciliary body, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that controls the shape of the lens. <clears throat> and then the choroid layer um, is the innermost vascular layer of the vascular tunic. The retina then is the innermost layer. It's made up of a pigmented and neural layer. You don't have to know the difference between those two. Um, but the retina is the layer of the eye where images will be focused on so your, that your photoreceptors can pick them up. So your cornea is transparent. It receives oxygen and nutrients from the lacrimal fluid. It joins the sclera at a place called the limbus. The sclera is what we call makes up the white part of the eye. It provides shape and protects the internal parts of the eye. Then the vascular tunic layer, uh, the choroid layer contains the vast network of capillaries. Uh, the ciliary body then is composed of ciliary muscles and ciliary processes, and these control the shape of the lens. Um, the lens itself is the large, clear-like, kind of circular, flattened structure that you see behind the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. You'll see the iris in your drawings. I think it's this person has blue eyes. So you'll see the iris in blue. The pupil is the hole in the eye. That's the black part. And right behind the iris and pupil, you'll see the lens. The lens is connected to the ciliary body by what we call ciliary processes. And then the ciliary muscle itself is what controls how those ciliary processes um, control the shape of the lens. The iris is the colored part of the eye with the pupil in the middle. Okay, so this picture 
explains it in a little better detail. You can see the three layers here, sclera, choroid, and retina, going from superficial to deep. You can see your cornea um, is the place where you would put a contact lens, your iris and pupil right behind them. You have the lens. And if you focus in on the ciliary body, you can see where they label the ciliary muscle. And then the ciliary processes or process um, will be the part leading out of the ciliary muscle to control the shape of the lens. So that's what the ciliary body is. Iris pupil. Uh, then the retinal layer, if we look at the back of the eye, we can see where the optic nerve will leave the eyeball itself. Um, so the optic nerve is the nerve what will that, that will carry all sensory information from the brain. And the optic nerve called cranial nerve number two is attached to the eye at the back of the eye and the place where it attaches we call that the optic disc. So the area in front of the optic nerve where it attaches to the back of the eyeball we call that place the optic disc. The macula lutea is an area or depression that surrounds the fovea centralis. I know macula lutea is not labeled on this picture um, and to be honest, on your pictures, you can probably hardly see it. You'll see a little tiny indent or depression in the retina, just lateral or above the optic nerve and optic disc. The macula lutea is an area, an oval-shaped area that surrounds the fovea centralis. And the fovea centralis is a depression within the macula lutea. It's about the size of a head of the, of the pin and the fovea centralis will be indented into the retina. You can see a slight indentation there above the optic nerve. Um, from, what else do we have here? From the lens, you can also see labeled suspensory ligaments. So the suspensory ligaments are going out and controlling. Um, they're kind of, let me see here from this picture, it's a little hard to see, but they'll be the white pieces that go off from the lens itself. So those are suspensory ligaments. They will attach to the ciliary body uh, to help control the shape of the lens. And then you can also see the posterior cavity and anterior cavity is also highlighted here as you're doing those labels. Okay, so a little bit more about the retina. This is the internal layer of the eye. Um, I'm going to pass by this slide. You can read it if you want to. Just feel free to pause at any time. This is a look at the retina. You can see the optic disc is the place where the optic nerve attaches. And then you'll be able to see the three layers of the eye with the fovea centralis is a little indentation within the retina. This is where you'll have the highest portion of cones, which are a photoreceptor. So there's the optic disc. Uh, we call it the area as the blind spot because it's the place on the retina that lacks all photoreceptors. Uh, the fo fovea centralis is a depression in the retina containing the highest proportion of cones and almost no rods. So we call this the area of sharpest vision because cones help you see um, precisely. And it's located within the macula lutea, which is lateral to the optic disc. And I show you a picture here a little bit better of the optic nerve, the optic disc that lacks photoreceptors, so we call that your blind spot. And then the fovea centralis has the greatest proportion of rods, and that's located with inside the macula lutea. You can also see your three layers here, the retina, choroid, and sclera. You'll see your pupil, your iris the lens connected to the suspensory ligaments that are connected to the ciliary body, which is made up of the ciliary muscle and processes. And again, the processes are just the little pink processes that are connected to your suspensory ligaments. So what do we mean, mean by blind spot? So each eye has a blind spot, an area where if an image gets focused on it, you won't be able to see it. And you can demonstrate this by looking at the picture on the right. If you close um, your right eye and put your left eye next to the screen, 
next to the plus sign and move the screen closer to your face, the black circle will eventually disappear from focus. If we were in lab, we would probably do this. Um, that's an ophthalmic view of the retina on the left showing the fovea centralis within the macula lutea and then where the optic disc is. You can see there are blood vessels in the eye coming out of there as well. So we talked about how your lens is a transparent, deformable structure. It's held behind the pupil by suspensory ligaments, um, and the suspensory ligaments will attach themselves to the capsule of the lens, and they will change the shape of the lens. They're caused, they're the changes in tension of those suspensory ligaments are caused by contraction and relaxation of ciliary muscles of the ciliary body uh, to accommodate something, and that means to look at something close. Uh, the ciliary muscles will contract and the suspensory ligaments will slacken or relax and that'll cause your lens to become more spherical or round shaped and that'll allow you to see things up close. So this is a look at how the lens changes shape in far vision and near vision. I won't ask you guys how it works. You might need to know that in anatomy lecture. You might, you will for sure need to know it in um, physiology. But just know that the lens changes shape, whether you're focusing on something far or something near. Here's a slide depicting the anterior cavity and the posterior cavity and describing the fluid within them, what the fluid does and if it's more fluid-like or viscous or gel-like. This is a great um, eye anatomy quiz if you want to copy and paste that website. Um, it's just great practice for labeling an eye, so I'll let you guys do that on your own. And then we'll get to the anatomy of the ear, hearing, and equilibrium. All right, so we're on the ear now, and the structures that you should focus on knowing are on page 122 of your lab book. Uh, the ear will divide into three regions, your external ear, your middle ear, and the inner ear. Pull up, let's, let's pull up a picture of what your external ear includes. It includes the auricle, which is the part of your ear made of cartilage. We all have different size ears, and that's your auricle. It's a funnel-shaped structure that'll um, direct sound into your ear. The external ear is also made up of the external acoustic meatus, also known as your ear canal, which will lead and end at the tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane is your eardrum. The middle ear is filled with air, and it's made up of three teeny tiny bones called ossicles. And those ossicles are attached to each other and will carry vibrations that the tympanic membrane creates from sound waves and it will transmit those vibrations through the middle ear. These auditory ossicles um, are the malleus, incus, and stapes. The malleus is attached to the tympanic membrane, the incus is in the middle, and the stapes looks like a stirrup. Um, if you've ever ridden a horse and been in a saddle, the stapes looks like the stirrup that you would put your foot in. Uh, the auditory tube drains into the nasopharynx, and the auditory tube is just filled with air because we're in the middle ear, and it helps to equalize pressure if you go up in the mountains to high altitudes or swim really deep underwater. Your auditory tube helps to equalize pressure. And then the inner ear, uh, we'll go into this in a little more detail. The inner ear is filled with fluid. It's made up of your vestibule, semicircular canals, and your cochlea. Um, the vestibule is made up of your utricle and saccule, which help with balance and equilibrium. The semicircular canals, you have three of them. They're filled with fluid. And then the cochlea looks like a snail shell. And the cochlea is where your photo, or not your photo, your mechanoreceptors will be located that help you with hearing. And we'll focus more on those in a little detail. This is a great video about the ear that I'll let you guys watch on your own time. This explains more about the external ear, the auricle, the external acoustic meatus, and then the tympanic membrane is the eardrum. 
Um, within the external acoustic natus, you have glands that produce a wax-like secretion. Uh, this wax is good, and you should never try to clean this out yourself because the wax actually helps to protect your things that from going into your ear. So if it really bothers you, get a doctor to help clean it out. This is the middle ear. Um, it contains an air-filled tympanic cavity, just medial to your, to your tympanic membrane. The auditory tube connects your middle ear to the nasopharynx, and then here's where we have your auditory ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And I'll show you a picture of these here. Here's a picture of the malleus connected to the tympanic membrane, the stapes, the incus is the one in the middle, and then the stapes is the one that looks like a stirrup. Uh, the stapes will be connected to what we call an oval window, which is an opening that will transmit vibrations through the bones into the vestibule of the inner ear. So when sound waves come into your ear, they will cause your tympanic membrane to vibrate, and those vibrations get amplified a hundredfold going through these teeny tiny ossicle bones. Those vibrations cause the stapes to kind of move up and down and pound against the oval window, which is the area right below the base of the stapes. Um, and that just moves the fluid that will be inside the inner ear in, in these canals. Then we get to the inner ear. This is located within uh, the temporal bone. Uh, it has different cavities that make up the bony labyrinth. We call them semicircular canals. And we have what we call the membranous labyrinth, with our, which are fluid-filled tubes and spaces. Um, these different areas are filled with different fluid um, that you guys will learn in physiology. So this is a look at the inner ear. In terms of things that you guys need to know, you see the vestibule um, located there with the utricle and saccule highlighted where they will be located. The semicircular canals are what is in parentheses underneath bony labyrinth, which has fluid in it. And then the cochlea is this snail-like structure. Um, the cochlea, when it's unwound, we can take a cross section of it and we can see that cross section here. So we've, what they've done is they've taken a little slice at one of um, the windings of the cochlea, and they're looking at the cavities within the cochlea here. Uh, these cavities within the cochlea, if you took AP 120, these should look a little familiar. Um, the cavities are divided into an uppermost cavity called the scala vestibuli, the cochlear duct, and then the um, scala tympani is the cavity below it. I will go into a little more detail about that in a couple of slides. So here's your here's your cochlea. It's the inner ear organ of hearing. It's snail shaped. It has a cochlear duct which we call the membranous labyrinth and then the bony labyrinth surrounds the cochlear duct and is split into two chambers with a scala vestibuli on top and the scala tympani on the bottom. You have a great picture labeling the parts of the cochlea on page 123 of your lab book. Um, this is just another view of it. So you see your scala vestibuli is the chamber on the top, the scala tympani is the chamber on the bottom, and then the cochlear duct is in between the two. Uh, within the cochlear duct, Right below it, we have an organ called the organ of corti. And that organ of corti is important because it contains what we call hair cells. And those are mechanoreceptor cells that when they move due to vibrations that are moving through the fluid in the cochlear duct, that the movement of those hair cells um, cause impulses to be sent um, through the vestibulocochlear nerve. And you see that vestibulocochlear nerve, it's labeled as branch, I think it's cranial nerve number eight, it says there. Um, this picture that's showing on the screen is a zoomed in view of the organ of corti. Um, the bottom or the basilar membrane, it makes up the bottom of the organ of corti. And the tectorial membrane is a structure in which the hair cells are embedded. 
So the tectorial membrane is where your hair cells will be kind of reach up and touch. And when those hair cells bend, that impulse of bending gets sent throughout your vestibular or cochlear nerve. Um, and that takes us through, what else do we have here? Vestibular membrane and basilar membrane. The vestibular membrane makes up the base of the scala vestibuli, and the basilar membrane makes up the roof of the scala tympani. Um, there's one thing we didn't mention yet was the round window, and we will get to that in the next slide. So you won't need to understand the process of hearing, but it helps a little bit to know how hearing works because then you can better identify these structures and why they're important and kind of what they do. So we have sound waves funneled by the auricle, like a funnel, into your external acoustic meatus. That causes your tympanic membrane to vibrate, which causes your ossicles, your malleus incus and stapes, to move. The stapes moves the oval window, transmitting the sound to the inner ear, and those pressure waves in fluid called perilymph of the scala vestibuli will deform or change the cochlear duct, and the region of the basilar membrane that matches the sound frequency will be displaced. So in that basilar membrane, that's the um, bottom part of the organ of corti, is displaced, it causes those hair cells to bend and that leads to impulses in the cochlear branch of your vestibular cochlear nerve. So here's a, a slide kind of showing how sound waves come in through the tympanic membrane, through your ossicles. The stapes transmit those sound waves through the oval window, causing the fluid to move as pressure waves. And the pressure waves then will move through the cochlea. And the co cochlea has been unraveled here. So you can kind of see the three sections. And then you see um, the organ. You can kind of see the organ of corti labeled there. It's been zoomed out with the hair cells being embedded in the tectoral membrane. These pressure waves that move through um, will eventually end at what we call the round window. And the round window is just an area um, where these pressure wa waves will end, and the round window kind of ends back where it started. Uh, it'll be right located below the oval window by your auditory tube. 